Looks like we're ready to go. Um, so welcome everyone to the SSP Astrophysics 2021 guest lecture series. Uh, I believe this will be the third astrophysics lecture this summer, but it is the first hosted by the NMT campus. And keeping with SSP tradition, there is one of our observing teams that is going to introduce the speaker. Um, so NMT team number six, um, Antara, Clara, and Franklin. It's all yours. All right. So it's our pleasure to introduce Dr. Nicholas Sunsef. Dr. Sunsef got his PhD in astrophysics from the University of California, Santa Cruz, and won the Robert J. Trumpler Award for his thesis. He was a teacher assistant for SSP in 1976 and 1977, worked with many observatories such as Cerro Tololo and Lick, and is now a professor of astronomy at Texas A&M. Dr. Sunsef specializes in the field of supernova cosmology. In 1994, he co-founded the High z Supernova Team, which later found evidence for the accelerating expansion of the universe. This breakthrough discovery revealed the existence of dark energy. In 2011, his team was honored with the Nobel Prize in Physics. For his significant contribution to the discovery of dark energy, Dr. Sunsef received the 2015 Breakthrough Prize in Fundamental Physics. Among his many projects and accolades, Dr. Sunsift has served on the board of museums, observatories, and private companies. He has held the position of Vice President for the American Astronomical Society. He has even taken on the responsibility of U.S. Delegate for the United Nations International Strategy for Disaster Risk Reduction. Today, we welcome Dr. Sunsift warmly as he shares his lecture at the three universes. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, I'm now going to share my screen. So let's uh, go here. Now let me try that again. Okay. And let me go put this in full mode. And let's at least move this bar out of the way so it doesn't look so bad. I'll put it down over here. Okay, Kai, are you able to see the full screen? Right now, we're just seeing a blank screen. Okay, that's what I was worried about. So let me get out of this. Sorry about this, it's taking a little while to get this done. Okay, let's try it this way. Okay, are you able to see my slide now? Yes, we can. Okay, okay well, thank you very much for inviting me. I was, oh, my SSP has a, there's a special place in my heart. I really enjoyed being a TA there, but mostly I really enjoyed interacting with the students. And um, it's been a continuing wonderful learning experiment experience for me. There are quite a few astronomers I've, I've met, met in my time who've either been TAs or students at SSP. So there's actually sort of an SSP club inside the astronomical community. What I'm gonna to talk to you about today is the universe and there are a lot of difficulties in trying to understand, trying to put your mind around what the universe is, but I think most of the confusion is in the wrong direction because actually the universe, understanding the universe, what we know and how big it is, is really kind of easy. And I hope that through this talk, I will begin to give you an idea of a good picture of how you see our, how you see our universe uh, as it is, as it started out, as it is today and what's going to happen in the future. Well, the two people who are sort of seminal in the theory of what I'm gonna be talking about are Albert Einstein, of course, who's on the right, but on the left, there's a person many of you probably have never heard of before. His name is George Lemaitre. He's a 
a PhD in, in physics from MIT, but also a Catholic priest in Belgium. And he, he lived at the, in the time about Al, uh, Albert Einstein. He was one of the few people who understood Albert Einstein's theory of general relativity. And Lemaitre, working independently, published in 1927, two years before Edwin Hubble discovered or was supposed to discover the expansion of the universe. Actually, George Lemaitre took the data, published a paper, and showed the universe was expanding and measured what was later to be called the Hubble constant. George Lemaitre really was a pioneer in the field. The one problem that George Lemaitre had was that he did all of his early papers in French and published it in a Belgian journal, which no one read. And so it was only after the, after the discovery of, of Edwin Hubble in 1929 and his famous paper to the publications of the National Academy of Sciences, where he, he measured the expansion of the universe and gave a number, which we now call the Hubble constant, only afterwards did people realize that George Lemaitre did exactly the same thing two years before. So George Lemaitre in, really should be credited with the discovery the, of the expansion of the universe, just taking data that was in the literature at the time and putting together his solutions to Einstein's general theory of gravity. So it's both easy and hard to understand what's going on in the universe and how big it is. So the easy thing is that we can define distances in the universe and we can, I can tell you how far away galaxies are and how far away the edge of the universe is. But there's a complication in that the universe is doing a bunch of things at the same time that we're talking about what the size of the universe is. The universe is, has a certain age. It started at a certain time. It's been expanding over time. It ex was expanding really quickly early on, then it slowed down and now it's speeding up. So the expansion hasn't been uniform, which kind of complicates things. And also the problem with the speed of light is that we can only see things when light gets to us. And although light travels really fast, it travels about a foot in a nanosecond, over distances across the universe, it takes billions of years. So we have to, in our mind's eye, put all of these facts together and try to conceptualize what the, what the universe looks like, how big it is. Well. The graph that I'm showing here is just a graph of what we know about what the universe is made up of. The, we now know the universe is made up of roughly 70% of something that has been called dark energy, although everything is energy in the end. So dark energy is just kind of a, a placeholder for the fact that we don't really know what's causing it. But dark energy acts exactly like anti-gravity. It is a anti-gravity. And if you measure up all of the energy associated with the anti-gravity in the universe, you'll find out that the mass energy equivalent of that is 70% of everything in the universe. So that's what this gray part is. The purple part is, is the part that is, is due to dark matter. And the little wedge here, the blue part, is the wedge that is due to normal matter. So these two wedges here, when you add them up together, constitute the matter in the universe. But most of the matter in the universe we don't see because it's called dark matter. But matter is has normal gravity. It's you know, the gravity of stuff that falls here. Even though dark matter we can't see, it also gives off just normal gravity. So if you look at this pie chart, they're really I want you to think that there are two parts to it. There's something called dark energy, which is 70% of the universe. And then there's the rest of the universe, which is matter, which is about 30% uh, of the universe altogether. So I'm, I'm saying that, that most of the universe is stuff that we can't see. You can't see dark energy. We can't see dark matter. Actually, most of the stuff in this pi wedge, which is normal matter, that is protons and electrons and Ozark water bottles and Chevys and whatever is not even that in that wedge. We only see about uh, one twenty percent of this wedge if we look at everything in, that are in the galaxies. So actually, when we make a census of what the universe is made up of, most of the normal matter actually we don't see also until very very recently. Very recently, we've now been able to see that most of the normal matter in the universe is in a thin gas in between the galaxies. So when I take a telescope and I look out at the universe and I look at all the galaxies and stars and planets, I'm really only seeing half a percent of what's out there. The rest of it, the missing normal matter, which is now no longer missing, it's a thin gas, 
dark matter, which I can't, can't see directly, and dark energy, which I can't see directly. With my telescope, I really can only see half a percent of the universe. So as an observational astronomer, that's really frustrating because I point a telescope at something and I want to see what's out there. And now I realize that what I'm looking at is at most half a percent of what's out there. Um, so, excuse me, Dr. Sansa. Oh, sorry yes. to interrupt. Yep. So we have a question from Chinmay who asks, if we don't know what dark energy actually is, how is a figure like 70% calculated? Is it through gravitational calculations or some other method? Okay, that's what I was, that's a great question. And I'll answer, that's what I was going to answer. If you look at the, the flag in the, the lower right, let me give you an analogy that if you're looking out a window and you see off in the distance a flag that's waving, you know that it's windy. When you step outside, you'll feel the wind. But when you look outside and you see the flag waving and you, you know it's windy outside, you actually don't see the wind. What you see is you, you see the effect of the wind on the flag. You're actually seeing the flag w waving in the wind. So exactly the same thing happens in understanding the universe. We don't see dark matter and dark energy, but we see the, the something in the universe that's pushing and pulling on gravity, uh, b b pushing and pulling on things. So the, the galaxies aren't just moving in a kind of random direction. Some of them are getting pulled quickly in one direction, and in other cases, they're getting pulled away from each other. And so we can map out the motions of the galaxies, and we, need, we see that we, we need two types of waving. We need one that looks like normal gravity. We need one that looks like an anti-gravity. So that although we don't know what it is, just like seeing a flag waving in the wind, we understand that there's something there because we see it affecting something that we can see, but we don't know what it is yet. So it's not one thing, unfortunately it's two things because one, at smaller scales, we see that we need more normal gravity to hold galaxies together. And at larger scales, we see we, we need an anti-gravity because at larger scales, it looks like things are moving apart very quickly. So it's, actually not hard to say, hard to understand where we get this diagram from, because I don't have to explain to you what dark matter and dark energy are. All I have to do is say, I'm seeing the flag waving in the wind. I'm seeing the galaxies being pushed and pulled. And it requires two things to explain how, how those galaxies are being pushed and pulled across the universe. And since we're measuring pushing and pulling, which is actually velocities, um, it's a very easy measurement to make. And so, it's not that difficult to, uh, as an observer these days, to show that, the, the, that this diagram is exactly the way the universe is put together. Again, unfortunately, that means that 96% of the universe, we can't explain. I don't know what dark matter is, and I don't know what dark energy is. And those are some of the biggest mysteries. There are thousands of people trying to figure out what dark matter is. It's probably a particle, but maybe it's um, some modification of gravity. There's a theorist in Holland called Verlinde who has a theory which sort of is able to come up with what dark matter is and also dark energy, but his theory has a lot of lots of holes in it at this point, and it's not generally accepted. It probably is wrong in the end, but we're all keeping an eye on it as he fixes up the theory. So this, this diagram while frustrating because it shows most of the universe is we can't see directly, is not frustrating because it's easy to measure that these things are there. So I hope that answers your question. Uh, Dr. Sansef? Yep. Uh, Jay wanted to know what clues are available in the studying of dark matter slash energy that can provide a better understanding of what it actually is and what barriers are there to studying this? What clues? Well, it depends on what you think dark matter is. Dark matter, if it's a particle, it's going to it's going to interact with things via something called the weak force. There are four forces in the universe: the nuclear force, which is called the strong force, electromagnetism, weak, and gravity. And so the weak force, the third force, is the one that this particle, if it's a dark matter particle, appears to interact with the universe. Now, dark matter particles can pass through your body and generally not interact with you, but every once in a while, a dark matter particle can interact with a nucleus. So physicists build these large tanks of things like liquid xenon, and they put scintillation detectors on them to search for sudden flashes of light. And if they get enough flashes of light at certain energies, they can say that these are consistent with a theoretical dark matter particle. 
Now, these experiments have been going on for over 30 years. They've gotten bigger and bigger. They're now in deeper and deeper mines in the in, in underground, but they still haven't found that particle. So there's still a lot of parameter space to explore, but things are getting pretty frustrated in trying to find the dark matter particle. There's another particle, which is a very light particle called the axion, which is also now uh, people are trying to trying to see if they have evidence for. So there's really, really active theory, experimental physics trying to find what this particle is. Parallel to that, there's a small group of people trying to explain away dark matter using uh, modifications to Einstein's general theory of relativity. And, but there are very few people that are doing that because again, there are two scales of gravities. There is the normal gravity, which is attractive, which is mostly dark matter. And then there's an anti-gravity, which is dark energy, which goes in the other direction. And it's hard to put those two scales together into a single mathematical theory like Einstein's theory of general relativity. Einstein's theory is, is a pure theory. You can't add any terms to Einstein's theory or you can't modify it without making it um, unsymmetric, let me put it that way. So if, any, if you ever come across something that Einstein's general theory of physics doesn't predict, the whole theory is wrong. So it's, it's a complete theory. Um, it's covariant, in other words, another way of putting it. So yeah, people are actively looking for it. Um, if obviously, if someone discovers it, that group, that person will win the Nobel Prize. So there's, there's a lot of egos on the line in terms of trying to find this, but lots of people are working on it. And so far we've discovered nothing. Okay, so going on to what the local universe looks like, here's a, a map of, all of the galaxies that we know of within about 1 billion light years of, of our position in the universe. And when the first parts of this map came out back in 1980 or so, we were rather shocked because galaxies aren't spread across the sky very uniformly. They form this very filamentary structure, as you can see there, kind of a, a web of galaxies. And these webs are very large. They're much larger than clusters of galaxies. It appears that galaxies often like to be in clusters of galaxies, but then those clusters of galaxies also like to cluster with other clusters of galaxies. And it's this clustering of clustering that we see as the stringy stuff in this, in this picture that you see here. The thing right in the center is the Milky Way, which blocks out the light from the galaxies on the other side of the that would come, we would see through the Milky Way because there's so much dust in the way. So that's why they put the Milky Way in the, the middle of this map. So this is a map of the universe. Um, those are the way the galaxies are. This is the way the universe look, looks. This is what we have to explain in cosmology to understand the evolution of the universe. Excuse me, Dr. Sunset. Yep. Uh, we have a question from Tanay who asks, how do astronomers measure distances and velocities on cosmic scales with just observations and telescopes. When we have margins of error with large orders of magnitude, how do we know our estimates, such as 70% for dark energy, are reasonable? Um, well, that was one of the, the, the things that another group that I co-founded invented, a, me a way of measuring distances into the, into the distant universe. There is a type of star that explodes um, the type of star is called a white dwarf. It's the burnt out core of a star like the sun. But stars that are somewhat larger than the sun, if the cores reach a certain mass, the core, this burnt out core, it's just made up of carbon and oxygen and nothing else. It's no longer burning. The star has disappeared and this core is just left over and is cooling down over time. This core is unstable. And if it gets larger than a certain mass, it will suddenly ignite and explode in a gigantic, thermonuclear explosion, and they're called type 1a supernovae. And because they only explode when they get to a certain mass, that means that the explosion always has the same energy, roughly. And if it has the same energy, that means we know what its intrinsic brightness is going to be. So if I see one that's far away, I know how far away it is because I know how, how many watts it is. So these, these type 1a supernovae have revolutionized our ability in astronomy to measure distances out into the far universe because I can see these things, I can find these things with large telescopes basically all the way across the universe. So we can measure, dist if we have good, good data on the brightness of these objects, we can measure a distance to about 
of one object. And if you get many, many objects, then you can reduce the 6% by statistics down to very, very accurate distances. So we can end up with a very, very accurate distance to different points in the universe, stars that are exploding in external galaxies. And then we can measure the redshift of that galaxy. That is, how much does that galaxy appear to be moving away from us? And all I have to do is take a spectrum of that galaxy and just look for the what, what people would call the Doppler shift to see how, how fast the galaxy appears to be moving away. It's an optical illusion. The galaxy is actually not moving. Nothing is moving like that in the universe. What's happening in space is stretching between us and that galaxy. So I have two pieces of evidence. I know the distance to the object, and I know how much the universe is stretching between those two points. And with that information, with lots and lots of different objects, I can pull out, for instance, the amount of dark matter and dark energy, because dark matter and dark energy affect the motions of galaxies, the expansion of the universe at different scales. So this is what the universe looks like 13.4 billion years ago. So this is 380,000 years after the Big Bang. The Big Bang being the what used to be called the beginning of the universe. The Big Bang is no longer the beginning of the universe. We now have evidence for something that's before the Big Bang. But this is, if you go backwards in time and you look at objects that are farther, farther away, those objects are actually younger than they are today because it took that light to get a long time to get to us. So as we look further and further into the universe, we see galaxies that are younger and younger and younger. And then all of a sudden we don't see any galaxies because we're now at the point where the universe is so young, the galaxies haven't formed. And then there is a stretch of, of the universe as we're looking even farther and farther, which is we don't see anything because the universe hasn't formed stars or galaxies yet. But as we're looking backwards in time, we're looking at the universe as it was smaller and smaller. And as it's smaller and smaller, it's hotter and hotter. The universe started out very hot and has cooled off over time. And so we look far enough back, we get to the point where the universe is about 3000 degrees. And this is about 380,000 years after the Big Bang. And at 3000 degrees, something special happens. There's enough energy in the light that the electrons can be ripped off of the hydrogen atoms. And so you end up with a proton and electron. And if you go back farther in time, the universe is smaller and hotter and the protons, the electrons, which are now freer, move around faster and faster and faster. But it, so if we reverse the clock and we look at the universe expanding from a very hot state to a cool state, as it cools, when it reaches 3000 degrees, it's now cold enough, the electrons can combine with the protons and form neutral hydrogen. Now, the, it's a big difference because an electron freely floating around scatters light and light can't get by the electrons. But when the electron combines with a hydrogen atom, then light can pass through that material very, very easily. So when the universe crosses this temperature uh, of about 3000 degrees as it's expanding and cooling, at 3000 degrees, the hydrogen becomes neutral, the electrons combine with the protons, and the universe becomes transparent. So from that point on, we can see in the universe if we have a big enough telescope. But before that, the universe is hotter, the electrons are stripped off, kind of like a flame, and we, it's very difficult for us to see farther into the universe. We can indirectly. So this is kind of the final picture we have of the universe, or the earliest picture directly of the universe. This is 380,000 years after the Big Bang. This is a picture taken with a um, a uh, millimeter telescope in space. This is the Planck satellite image. And you're seeing tiny fluctuations in the temperature. It's not all exactly 3000 degrees. There are little parts that are cool and little parts that are hotter. And those temperature differences are only about one ten thousandth of the temperature at that point. So these are very small temperature fluctuations. But in any event, this is what the universe looks like 13.4 billion years ago. And the universe has expanded and cooled to what it is today. And we'll, be, we'll come back to this because this is a very important picture. And the way I look at this picture is different than everyone else. So I would like to explain to you what I see in this picture as opposed to everyone else. Um, excuse me, sorry to interrupt, yep. but Jimmy has a question. Yep. Uh, so he asked, what is the current take on the origin of the universe? Um, do most astronomers believe it was a singularity? And what other properties would it have? And are there any other hypotheses? 
I'll get to that towards the end of the talk. Um, I'm not gonna talk about singularity. Singularity is a concept in general relativity having to do with black holes. And a singularity isn't a thing, it's where mathematics breaks down and where basically you end up dividing by zero. So there is almost certainly no singularity to the, ex to the creation of the universe. You can't point to a singularity everywhere. We have singularities all around us in the middles of black holes. But the universe, the formation of the universe is somewhat different than the formation of a black hole. But I'm, I'm not gonna get into that right now, but I'll get back to sort of part of the subject towards the end when I get to talking about why we need three different universes to describe a single universe. So I, I wanna just go through a litany of weird things about our universe. Um, perhaps the most profound thing about the universe is that it's really black between, between the stars. Um, here's a picture of the Hubble deep field. Um, this is the, I think this is the extreme deep field where they, they took the Hubble Space Telescope and they took image after image after image of the same sky in a couple of different colors for a couple of weeks and then added all the images together and you see this image. And so what you're seeing here, everything in this image is basically a galaxy. There may be one star, which is down over here or something, but everything else is a galaxy. But the interesting thing about this image is that in between all these galaxies uh, is it's black. You can't see anything. So most of the sky is actually black. This is as deep as we go. We're seeing to the, the edge of the formation of the galaxies. We're so looking so far back in time. We're looking back to about 500 million years after the Big Bang that if we look any farther, we're not going to see any galaxies because they haven't formed yet. So this shows that the universe is black in between galaxies, which may not be surprising to you, but it's actually the, the most profound observation you can make in cosmology. And that observation is that when the sun goes down, it's dark. That's something we don't think about, but it's really kind of weird that it gets dark when the sun goes down. And let me, it's called Olber's paradox. And it's a very simple concept and I'll explain it to you you have to think about it. And if you think about it, there should be an aha moment where you finally understand what, what it is I'm talking about. But let me give you the explanation. And the interesting thing about the explanation I'm about to give you was the first mathematical description of the reason why the sky is black was due to this guy who you probably may recognize, Edgar Allan Poe. Poe was a brilliant man. He um, he was, he was an engineer. He went to university, although he's kicked out of two universities because he, I guess he was so weird. He was a poet. Um, he did many things, but in one of his final works called Eureka, which is a very strange book of prose that was published by, by, uh, by Congress. Um, he was a speech given in New York, but it was published in congressional records. He actually gives the mathematical description of why the night sky is black. And goes like this. So if I look at the sun, not directly, but if I looked at the sun with through a tube and the tube is smaller than the disk of the sun, when I look in that direction, all I will see is the brightness of the sun. And that brightness of the sun corresponds to the surface of the sun, which is about 6,000 degrees. If I take the sun and I move it farther away, the disk size gets smaller. But now if I use a narrower straw, that is smaller than the disk size of the sun. And I look through the straw, the inside of the straw still has the same brightness. It still looks like it's 6,000 degrees. So no matter how far away a star is, if, if I have a straw that's thin enough and I put it on that star such that the, the, the straw is smaller than the disk of the star, when I look through that straw, the inside will still look like it's 6,000 degrees. So what Edgar Allan Poe noted was that if you, have an infinite universe, sooner or later, every direction that you're going to look at in the, in the universe, you're going to see a star. Let me, I like to put it this way. Suppose you're driving down a country road and someone has planted a, a row of trees to the side. And as you look through the, the trees, there are spaces in between the trunks and the leaves and you can see the field beyond it. Now, if they put a second row of trees, that would block out some of the parts that you can see through. And so now you see less of the field and the trees. And if they put a third row, you see less and a fourth row, et cetera. As a matter of fact, if they put in a certain number of rows, 
depending on the size of the leaves and the trunks, at some point you can't see through the forest and see the, the field behind it. So it takes a finite number of rows of trees before you can't see through the forest to what's behind it. The same thing happens in our universe. If you have, if our universe was infinite, every direction that we would look at in our universe, you would see a star. It may be very far away, but the disk of that star, even though it's tiny inside that disk, it still looks like it's about 6,000 degrees. So what, what Edgar Allan Poe noted was that if the universe is infinite, every direction in the sky should look like the sun. That is every little pixel in the sky. And therefore the whole sky should be the temperature of the sun. That is when the sun goes down, the sky is still gonna be 6,000 degrees because everywhere you look, it's going, there's going to be a star. Some, some close, some distant, it doesn't matter. So he said, well, it isn't. And so therefore the universe is finite. So the fact that there is black in between the galaxies is the easiest and the most profound observation you can make in cosmology. The night sky is black because the universe is finite. Now I'm not telling you how it's finite. It could be finite in size, it could be finite in time, it could be finite in something, but the, but the blackness of the sky means that the universe is finite. There are also all sorts of other things that are weird about the universe. And so I'm gonna just give you a bunch of facts. Some of them we understand, some of them we don't, but um, these are the ones that came to mind. First of all, that we, we now know the universe didn't start with the Big Bang. We now, we now can see things that represent something that happened before the Big Bang. There are no magnetic monopoles, completely different fact, but you take a magnet, you break it in half, and you don't have a North Pole and a South Pole, you now got two magnets, each one with a North Pole and a South Pole. No matter how hard you try, you can never have a North magnetic charge or a South magnetic charge. They always come together. So why is that? Why are there no magnetic monopoles? For in the early universe, if everything, there's equal amounts of matter and antimatter in the universe, matter and antimatter all annihilate each other. So if there were equal amounts, the universe would be just made up of light because everything, all the matter and antimatter annihilate and produce photons of light. So in order for our universe to be filled with matter, there has to be a little bit of imbalance in the early universe between the amount of matter and the amount of antimatter. And it turns out that for roughly one, every billion particles of, of antimatter, there are a billion plus one particles of normal matter. So the universe is very close to being equal in matter and antimatter, but it's just slightly tilted in favor of matter. Well, why is matter more, why is there more matter than antimatter? That's a fundamental question in physics that we don't, haven't answered. But if, if they were exactly the same, if the universe produced the same amount of matter and antimatter, we wouldn't be here. Because of this weird expansion of the universe, 94% of the galaxies that we see today, we will never see when they're 14 billion years old. That is, the universe is 13.8 billion years old right now. Every galaxy right now is, is sending out light, the light of its stars into the universe. And that light is going out into the universe and it's taking time to, to, to travel out into the universe. But in, in the same time, the universe is expanding. So what I'm saying here is that the galaxies that we see today, which uh, which is they, that light that's, that's gotten to us has taken a while to get here. So the galaxies that we see today, actually that light is from earlier time in the universe, but right now there's also light leaving from that galaxy. That light is never going to get to me because the universe is going to expand faster and faster and faster. And sooner or later, it's gonna expand so fast, it's gonna be faster than the speed of light. So it's kind of like a, a salmon swimming upstream. If, the, if you have a stream that's rather slow, the salmon can swim upstream and get to its source. But if the stream is going really, really fast, even if the salmon is swimming fast, the stream will carry the salmon down, down the, the, the creek back into the ocean. The same thing is happening in our universe, that although the light is coming towards us, the universe is stretching faster and faster, that the light is not able to catch up with the expansion of the universe, and the expansion of the universe carries light back towards the direction it came from. So most of the galaxies we see today with telescopes, we're never going to see when they're 14 billion years old like they are today. That light is never going to get to us. Uh, excuse me, Dr. Sansev? Yep. 
Um, Matt wanted to know, as the universe expands and the distance between bodies of matter decreases, will dark energy also grow less dense throughout the universe or will it remain constant? Um, well, dark energy right now, we, we have pretty good limits on the way dark energy behaves. And it looks like dark energy is a property, a pure property of the vacuum. That is, no matter what time it is in the universe, except when in the early universe and in inflation, dark energy is always the same in every square, in every cubic meter of space. So any piece of space around me has exactly the same amount of dark matter. There's a dark energy. If I jump billions of years into the future and I take the same, if I take one cubic meter of material, a vacuum, it's going to have the same amount of dark energy. So as the universe expands and the volume of the universe gets bigger and bigger, there's more dark energy in the universe, but the amount of dark energy per unit volume in every cubic meter is exactly the same. So far, we have no evidence that dark energy changes its strength, um, the energy density, so to speak, over time. And we're looking at that very, very carefully. And we've, we can show to about 1% that it's not changing in a certain manner. And we also have one more question from Umran. Uh, when the universe was hotter after the Big Bang, did we have particles that can't exist in the laws of physics now? And were the laws of physics different? As far as we know, the laws of physics are the same. Um, if the laws of physics are, were different, then this map back here would look very, very different. So we can use the laws of physics as we know it and we can show why this map is the way it looks. That is why there are little fluctuations of temperature at 400,000 years after the Big Bang. If you're going to create new particles, exotic particles with new physics, it's going to affect the way this map looks. But with the physics we have today, we can explain this map. It doesn't prove that there are particles, other particles that don't exist, that, that existed a long time ago, but it's pretty strong evidence. Uh, as for physics changing, um, we can measure many of the fundamental constants of nature, the gravitational constant, the strength of the electromagnetic force. We can measure those things by looking at properties of distant galaxies. And so far, we have seen no evidence for changes in the fundamental constants. The one constant that's almost impossible to measure, though, is a change in the speed of light. If the speed of light changes over time, everything else changes. All the other constants change by the same amount. So, so changing the speed of light takes a, is a much more difficult thing to measure. We have indirect measurements of the change of speed of light over time, which show that it's not changing. But it's a bit interesting big question that hasn't been solved very well at this point. Excuse me, Dr. Sunset. Yep. We have a question from Alice who asks, uh, why are these pictures of the universe oval shaped as opposed to circular or some other shape? Is it based on how we look out from Earth? Oh, I should have said that. No, it's just like the Mercator projection. You take, how do you show the whole uh, whole map of the Earth? Well, you 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 cut the sphere and you you kind of press it down, and you end up with kind of an oval shaped thing. So you have to take that oval shaped object and imagine that it wraps around you like a sphere. So it's just a projection that we use, a mathematical projection of a curved surface projecting it into a flat plane. Um, it's, not, it's not as if I see an oval up there. What that is, that oval is actually the whole sphere around me, all four price to radians around me. OK, so the, another interesting fact is the space is flat to better than 1%. And what I mean by that is that there are different types of geometries. And in, our, in a flat geometry, if you add up all the angles of a triangle, you end up with 180 degrees um, or pi if you, use, uh, if you use those units. However, in curved geometries, you add up the angles and they don't add up to 180 degrees. As a matter of fact, the, the formula for the, um, the addition of angles in any triangle in any geometry is that if you add up the three angles, alpha, beta, gamma, it's equal to pi, pi but plus or minus the area of the triangle divided by the radius of the curvature of the, of the object on which it's sitting upon. So as an example, it's easy to think about the Earth. So take the Earth and take a, start at the North Pole and drop two lines of longitude that start out 90 degrees apart from each other and take them down to where they hit the equator. Now draw the third side 
from where they along the equator. So now you have a, an equilateral triangle starting at the pole with a 90 degree angle coming down and hitting the equator at 90 degree angles. So you have an equilateral triangle with three 90 degree angles in it. Well, three times 90 is 270, it's not 180. So adding up the angles in a large triangle in the universe, can you can measure the curvature of the universe. That is, is it flat or is it, is it curved like a sphere or is it curved like a saddle? And to about 1%, the universe appears to be geometrically flat. So that's another thing that we're gonna to have to explain about the universe. When you start coming up with curved universes, and certainly the universe does curve very strongly near black holes, your geometry gets completely crazy. So pi is defined in a flat geometry as the circumference of a circle divided by its diameter. Now, and pi is this wonderful irrational number that maybe a few of you know to 100 places. Uh, usually some people can measure it, they can memorize it to thousands of places, places, but it's an irrational number. But that's not true in curved geometries. For instance, in on a sphere, pi can be equal, exactly equal to two. So imagine a circle on um, a circle of latitude on the earth. And so the center of the circle is at the pole and a circle is defined by the, the, the figure that is an equal distance from that particular point. So if we think about a circle on the sphere and we take the center of the circle on the pole and we take the circle as the equator, well, the, the size of the equator is going to be two pi and the other side going the, the diameter of the circle goes from the equator up through the pole down to the other side. Well, that's half of that. So that's equal to pi. So the circumference divided by the diameter is equal to the, excuse me, the circumference is two pi, the diameter is pi. So pi is equal to two for the equator. So pi is actually a variable in when your geometry isn't flat. And to even be a little bit more confusing, if you think about it, on a sphere, there are actually two values of pi for each circle. And I'll let you figure out why that's the case. So in, when you start allowing things to get warped due to gravity, simple geometry gets thrown out the window and things like pi are no longer a constant, they become variable. Uh, Dr. Sunsef? Yep. Um, Chinmay wanted to know, can you elaborate on what space being flat or curved means? What does it mean for a, a spherical object like the Earth, roughly, to exist in flat space? Flat, well, that's what I was trying to say. Flat space is Cartesian flat. There are three, three perpendicular coordinates like this, and we can probe how flat the, the universe appears by adding up angles and triangles. Now our universe exists in four dimensions, the fourth dimension being time. So it's hard to imagine a three-dimensional flatness that's inserted into four dimensions. But we certainly can, we can understand a two-dimensional flatness, just a plane inserted in three dimensions. We deal with that all the time in, in, in our imaginations. So the, we have to measure the curvature of the universe by doing things like measuring the value of pi, which we don't do directly, but in a sense we're doing that, or measuring the, the, the angles between objects. And that's actually how we do measure the, the curvature by measuring many, many angles between galaxies and seeing whether it, what cor whether it corresponds to a flat, a, a spherical universe or a saddle shaped universe. So we don't see it, but we are able to measure it. Okay, so as I saying, we also have clear evidence for a universe prior to the Big Bang. Um, and except for small motions for galaxies that are near each other, there's actually nothing moving in the universe. The universe is stretching in between the galaxies, but that's not a kinetic energy, it's a stretching. So it is not the case that things can't go faster than the speed of light in an expanding universe. They can apparently go faster than the speed of light because nothing is moving, it's space that is stretching. So when people say that the speed of light is the speed limit, that's true in special relativity. It's true in our everyday life. But when we get to the size of the universe and its origins and expansions, things can, in a mathematical sense, go faster than the speed of light.
Um, just other some random weird things about the universe is that normally when you see something in the distance, it's smaller than when it's closer. It's kind of obvious if a tree is farther away, it's smaller. That's not true in our universe. And this is now a, 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 a curvature of space thing. The farther something away is in our universe, it doesn't get any smaller. So when you look at a very, very deep object, deep image of the universe, like the Hubble Deep Field, we don't know how far away these galaxies are until we measure a, a, bright, a supernova or some other way of measuring the distances. But by just by looking at how big they are on the sky and how many pixels across they are, we can say that galaxy is bigger than the other one. Because if you take one of those galaxies and move it farther away, it doesn't get smaller. It stays the same apparent size. So there's an optical illusion here, but it's a great optical illusion because I can point to any of these galaxies and I can tell you which one is larger or which one is smaller just based on its linear size in the sky. You can't do that in normal life. If something is, is smaller, you don't know whether it's small and close to you or small or big and far away from you. But our universe, we just have this weird optical illusion that things don't get smaller the farther away they go. The number of galaxies in our universe is about two trillion, but our universe, as it's expanding, as it expands, things come into the edge of the universe. And so new galaxies will begin to appear in the universe as the universe gets older. And so the number of galaxies right now is increasing over time. And as the universe expands, we'll get more and more galaxies. But this weird dark energy stuff is causing the universe to expand faster and faster, which means that at some point, the galaxies near the edge of the universe will apparently go faster than the speed of light and they'll disappear from our universe. So over the next couple of billion years, about 15 billion years, if you count up the number of galaxies, the number of galaxies is going to be increasing as we expand into something which we don't have a good name for. But then after, and then we're going to get up to about five, billion, 5 trillion galaxies in the universe. But then as the universe expands, those galaxies at the edge are going to begin to move faster than the speed of light away from us, and they're going to begin to disappear. So there's going to be a sweet spot of the maximum number of galaxies in our universe in about 15 billion years from now. And after that, the galaxies more and more rapidly begin to disappear from the sky. And I'll talk about that at the very end of this talk. Another weird thing that people don't talk much about, and this is really, really weird, is this the Higgs boson. The Higgs boson was discovered uh, a couple of years ago at CERN, and it's a subatomic particle um, associated with the field that allows certain particles, leptons, things like electrons and muons and so forth to have mass. And there was a, it was a big mystery because the fundamental theory of physics called the standard model predicted that electrons wouldn't have mass, which is clearly crazy because electrons do have mass. So the Higgs particle was discovered. We now can, we now the standard model is as complete as we're gonna have it for a while and everything is fine, except for one problem, is that the mass of the Higgs boson is very close to a tipping point where it becomes unstable. And this un instability is, if it goes unstable, then suddenly mass gets sucked out of these particles and the mass changes in these particles. So if the Higgs boson, which is right at this, this uh, this tilt, tilting point, if it's a little bit more massive, that's okay. If it's slightly less massive, it starts causing matter to appear or disappear. It's, it's an instability in the field. And we don't know exactly, but it looks like if that happens, it could destroy the universe or it could spawn a new universe. But the question is, why is the Higgs boson very close to this tipping point? There's no reason why it would be. It clearly, it can't be over the tipping point, the instability, because then we wouldn't exist, but it could be much, much heavier and we would still exist happily. So why is the Higgs boson almost unstable? I don't have an answer to that. Um, um, excuse me, we have a question. Uh, so Jay is asking, could you comment on the discontinu discontinuity of time due to Einstein's theories and how it manifests on space levels, such as how that affects the planes that everything in the universe exists on? The discontinuity in time, I don't, sorry, I don't quite understand what that means. Um, are you talking about the discontinuity when you fall into a black hole? Um, I'm, if you could ask the person to clarify the question. Um, 
Wait. Okay, we can come back to this. Okay, actually. why don't you come back to it? So, um, so as the universe formed, it, it expanded, it slowed down due to normal gravity, but about 6 billion years ago, that gravity began became so weak that it, the other form of gravity, the anti-gravity began to take over. And that anti-gravity over time has gotten stronger relative to normal gravity. And so our universe is now being driven, not by normal gravity, but by anti-gravity. So the evolution of our universe from now and into the future is just due to this anti-gravity called dark energy. And this flip over happened about 6 billion years ago. Why? We don't know. We don't understand dark matter. We don't understand dark energy, but it's easy to show that the universe appears to be accelerating. That is the stretching of the universe is getting, is, is getting faster and faster and faster in between galaxies. Um, um, I think the question asker clarified the question. Okay. So they're asking, uh, so about the discontinuity of time, they're asking as in how only the speed of light is constant and not time itself. Should I repeat the entire question once? Yeah, go ahead, please. Please okay. repeat it. Uh, so the question is, could you comment on the discontinuity of time due to Einstein's theories and how it manifests on space levels, such as how that affects the planes that everything in the universe exists on? And then um, the discontinuity of time was referring to as in how only the speed of light is constant and not time itself. I don't quite understand what discontinuity, what time being constant is. Let, let me answer a, a peripheral question that I, I think is a, perhaps a, a more interesting question is, according to Einstein's gen, spe, special theory and general theory of relativity, re, general theory is a gravitational theory, special relativity is just about motions of things that are not accelerating. It requires four spatial dimensions. Three dimensions are space and one dimension is time. The three dimensions of space we know are like this, they're X, Y, and Z perpendicular. The fourth one, time, well, what the heck is it? Well, there is one really weird thing about time is that, is that if you think about the, the three spatial dimensions like this, I'm sitting in my chair here, I can move you know, in X direction like this, I can move in the Y direction like this, and if I wanted to, I could jump up and down in the Z direction. I have free will in three, the three spatial dim dimensions. A free will up to the fact that I can't travel faster than the speed of light, or I can't push myself faster than the speed of light. But that fourth dimension, time, is completely different because I have absolutely no free will in time. I'm always stuck at exactly one point in time, and that point is called the present. So we have four dimensions, but they don't behave the same. Three of the dimensions allow free freedom of will. The fourth dimension, we're always stuck at the same point in time. It's called the present. I can't jump to a second beforehand or a second. I don't have the ability to move back and forth in time like I do in the other three dimensions. Um, that's, uh, it's not an explanation, it's sort of an experimental fact. So why is it we're always stuck at one point in time? Why is it we can't move backwards and forwards in time? We actually think you can move backwards, forwards in time inside a black hole that's spinning. And that's the concept behind the movie Interstellar, but I won't get into that anymore. So let me let me get on with the, the talk and, and maybe the question can be rephrased because I still don't completely understand it. So, Let's think about the universe as it is. So right now, our universe is 13.8 billion years old. The light from the most distant objects has to be that age or less. The most distant galaxies are about 13, the light has taken about 13.2 billion years to get to us. But that is the extent of the universe we can see. We call this the observable universe. But the, that's not how big the universe is because that light left at the, the edge of the universe 13 some odd billion years ago. The universe has expanded since then. And so the universe is now much bigger. So we, have, we create in general relativity a concept called proper time and proper distance. And a proper distance is you take the universe as it is right now and completely freeze it. Don't allow it to contract or expand or do whatever. We're gonna take all the galaxies and stop the whole expansion immediately. And now we, with the, everything stopped, we can now measure with a ruler the distance to every object in, in, in the universe. And when we do that, if we stop the expansion of the universe and get our ruler out, the 
edge of the universe is 46 billion light years from us because although the light only took 13.8 billion years to get to us, since the universe has expanded, it's now 46 billion light years away at the, the very edge. The universe is, as it gets older, that edge, which is at 46 billion light years, gets, far, gets farther and farther away. And as it gets farther and farther away, presumably we're expanding into something that looks exactly like our universe. So we expect that as the universe ages, galaxies will come in at the edge. So the number of galaxies will, ex will increase over time up for the next 15 billion years, and we'll end up with about 5 trillion galaxies. And then the expansion will be, very, will be much faster, and those galaxies will begin to disappear at the edge. Okay, so everything within, so let's ask the question, the galaxies are emitting light right now, every galaxy in the universe. How far away is a galaxy going to be such that we can see the light that's being emitted today? That is, that galaxy is emitting light right now. Will we be able to see that light in the future? And if we ask that question, the distance to the galaxies that we will be able to see when they're 14 billion years old is about 15 billion light years. It's much smaller. So any, any galaxy right now that's more than 15 billion light years away from us, remember the universe is, the edge of their universe is at 46 billion light years, those galaxies, the light that's leaving it, us today is, will not get to us. So we can see those galaxies now, but we'll never see those galaxies when they're 14 billion years old, because that light is, is trying to, to swim upstream against a universe that's expanding faster than the speed of light. So between about 46 billion light years and 66 billion light years away, those galaxies we can't see right now, but in the next 15 billion years, those galaxies will come into our, into our universe and we'll be able to see them as they are young, and then later on they'll disappear. Anything that's farther away than 66 billion light years in our universe that's expanding due to dark energy, we will never see. So you have to imagine that our observed universe is something that's smaller inside a much larger universe. We're expanding, this other thing is expanding that we're inside of. And because of the expansions going faster and faster, everything outside of the present 66 billion light years, if we freeze the expansion and, and, and measure the distances, anything that's farther away than 66 billion light years, we will never see in our universe. So- Oh, sorry. Yeah. It, um, we had yep. a question from Matt who asked, um, will galaxies disassemble as the Earth expands, as its components drift away from each other? And if so, does that mean that the force of expansion is significantly stronger than the gravity that holds galaxies together? And what does this mean for the eventual fate of our universe? Well, that's another question that's a fundamental question in cosmology is that dark energy is an anti-gravity, normal gravity is a normal gravity, which one wins? And right now, the amount of dark energy that we're measuring in our universe apparently is such that dark energy is always going to lose relative to normal gravity at smaller scales. So everything that's within um, a couple, about a hundred, no, no, less than that, about a few megaparsecs, a few, uh, about 10 million light years away from us is close enough that the amount of gravity between us and that galaxy is strong enough that dark energy, which is anti-gravity, which we pushed pulling them away, is never going to be strong enough to move those galaxies away from each other. So we'll always be gravitationally bound to each other. Anything that's farther away than that, dark energy wins over normal gravity, and those galaxies will be moving faster and faster away from us and ultimately disappear from the sky. But there's also a possibility that the there's a higher what's called what we call attention to dark energy and that dark energy will change over time and actually begin to overwhelm normal gravity. And in that case, dark energy can, can pull apart the stars in the galaxy, can pull apart the, the planets in our solar system. It'll pull apart the earth. It'll pull apart the electrons from the, from the nuclei. It'll pull the, the protons and the neutrons from the nuclei apart. It'll, it'll pull the, the uh, quarks apart. It goes, the dark energy goes in and pulls everything apart. We call this the great rip. And it's very important for us to measure the, the type of dark energy that we have. 
Are we going to go into a great rip such that dark energy is going to take over the universe and rip everything apart? Or is dark energy of a lower tension such that it will pull distant galaxies apart, but it's never strong enough to go into things and start pulling things apart at the microscopic level? Uh, Dr. Sunsef. Yeah. Um, we have a couple questions. Uh, one from Bra Bronwyn is, could you, could you expand on how it's possible for galaxies to not appear smaller as they move farther away? Um, I don't have a good, good explanation. I don't have a good picture of this. Um, okay, suppose you're sitting at the, at the, the North Pole, and you have a telescope, and the telescope is looking out, and it's it look it can see a particular angle. Say it's a it's an arc minute or a couple of arc minutes. Then you can you will see in the, through that telescope anything that is with it was in that angle. Okay, so imagine you draw two lines of longitude that are on either sides of that angle, and those two lines of longitude will go down to the equator and then come come back together on the South Pole. So everything inside this, um, inside this uh, angle will be in between these two lines of longitude, okay? So if you now think of how wide the, those two lines of longitude are apart, as when, you're, when those two lines of longitude along a line of latitude are very close together when you're at the pole, but they get farther and farther apart, apart until they get down to the equator, but they're still within the angle that you're looking at. But then as you go beyond the equator, they begin to get smaller and smaller again. So things, if, if you're looking at a particular angle on the surface of a sphere, things that are following lines of longitude, as they get farther away, get stretched until they get down to the equator. And then they get scrunched together as they go down beyond the equator to the South Pole. So the, the geometry of what you're seeing actually the object, object will appear stretching as they go down to the equator and will end up shrinking as they go beyond the equator. The same thing happens in our universe. As two light particles are coming at you, the universe is also expanding. And so the light particles are diverging like this. And so what they started out as being very small, close together, they actually end up being larger like this, which means they're getting magnified because you're still looking at this object, but the, the light, because the expansion of the universe between the, the two particles of light is expanding, they begin to separate. So the expansion of the universe acts as a magnification of, the, of things that are distant. Um, uh, yeah. yeah, thank you. And the other two related questions are from Katrina and Jeremy. Jeremy. Okay. And they say, uh, when you say that any galaxy further away, uh, 66 billion light years won't be in our universe, does that imply that there are multiverses? And also, to clarify, could dark energy be treated as more of an inherent property of space-time? How does space-time expand? Does space multiply? If it multiplies, since each unit of space has the same amount of dark energy, would that somehow explain the acceleration of the expansion of the universe? <laughs> those are great questions. I don't know if I have enough time to answer all of those. Um, uh, what do I want to, which one do I want to answer? Um, uh, let me set that, that those questions aside because I think I will, in the time remaining, although I've got it, I'm going to have to cut out some of the things I was going to talk about because these are great questions. Uh, I think some of those things will be, be answered. Okay. So let me, let me go on. So I already, I already told you about galaxies. I've already told you about what the universe is made up of. I've already told you that uh, X, Y, and Z are different than T. Um, but what I really wanted to talk to you about are why we need three universes to describe what we're seeing. Um, so again, this is the content of the universe, dark energy, all matter, some dark matter, some normal matter. It's kind of weird that the there's a subatomic particle called a neutrino and there are billions of them passing through your body right now that don't interact with you. The amount of mass neutrinos to within a factor of 10 is the amount of mass that exists in stars in the universe. Our eyes can't see these other particles, but by no means are the stars in our universe the most important things. There are other constituents of the universe, even 
not dark matter and dark energy, but things like neutrinos that begin to rival the mass content of just normal stars in our universe. The universe is just, we, we look at the universe with the wrong eyes. We, everything that's out there, we pretty much can't see with our telescopes because it's missing or it's hard to identify. Um, so I've already explained to you about the future of the universe. Um, so let me talk about the universes. So I'm now going to try to, to explain to you why we need three universes to describe the universe that exists. People in astronomy throw out the word universe, and universe means everything, but they don't ex explain to you what everything is. Is it everything that we can see? Is it everything that we need to explain what we see? Is it everything that that we see and, and can explain and then add on some stuff that we, we're just speculating about. There are all manners of different sizes of universes that exist in our theories, but there are actually three universes, a minimum number of three universes that we need to describe our present universe. So the easiest one to understand is the observable universe. Everything that we see right now, again, we're gonna freeze the universe, stop it from expanding, count up all the number of galaxies, and that's our observable universe. That present universe is 14, is, has a radius of 46 billion light years. It's got about 2 trillion galaxies. So if you take this observable universe that we see today and you shrink it down, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller, gets hotter and hotter and hotter. And at some point it reaches a temperature that is a temperature that begins to affect the fundamental forces of nature. And if you get, when you get to this temperature, three of the forces of nature, the, the strong force, the nucleus, the electromagnetic force and the weak force, all of those forces combine to be a single force as you go backwards in time. And if you go farther, if you try to go farther back, the universe becomes hotter and it becomes even more dense and other particles like magnetic monopoles will begin to come into existence. But we don't see the effects of mag mag magnetic monopoles in our universe. If we did, we would see them in the structure of this microwave background radiation. So we think that the universe had to start at a particular temperature and a particular density. So if I take our present universe and shrink it back down till it gets to this particular density and stop it there, because if we go farther, we'll begin to produce things that we will affect the cosmologies that we see with our telescopes. That observable universe, let me jump beyond all of this, is about the size of a beach ball. So take all of our observable universe and shrink it down to the point where if we shrink it more, weird physics begins to happen that universe right now would be about the size of a, of a beach ball. Everything, all, all two trillion galaxies. So that's one universe. That's our observable universe right now. But I just said that our universe, as it ages, our observable universe is getting bigger, not just in size, but there are more galaxies that are coming into the edge. So it's clear our universe is expanding into something else, something else that is larger that has more mass, has more galaxies than our present universe. How big is that universe? So we're, we're, a, we're a beach ball inside some much larger other universe. Well, it's hard for us to measure what this other universe is because we can't see it, but we can indirectly infer the minimum size of this other universe by looking at how curved our present universe is. And when we do that, we do that calculation, we find that the second universe, the universe we're expanding into, has to be at least about 250 meters across at the time our observable universe was the size of a beach ball. So at the time when, our, when the Big Bang, when the universe was at this special temperature, our observable universe that we have today is, it was the size of a beach ball we can show by looking at the curvature of the present universe that that beach ball size thing has to be inside a bigger universe that's at least 250 meters across. It could be much more than that. It could even be infinite. We don't know, but it has to be that size. So our observable universe is expanding into something bigger and that bigger thing used to be 250 meters across. 
So I want you to have in your mind's eye that everything we see is the beach ball and inside we're inside something that is spherical that's 250 meters across. And this is what we call the Big Bang. This is where our universe as we see it started. So a tip, the thing that I, I looked online, well, what's about 250 meters across? Well, there's a spherical uh, uh, liquid gas tank. So these things are if about the size of the minimum size of the second universe into which we're expanding. Of course, this universe is also expanding. So, and this universe, the, the stuff in it, most of it is expanding faster than the speed of light away from us. So we're never going to see it. But based on the, on the curvature that we measure, we know that our beach ball size observable universe back at the Big Bang has to be inside something that is this big. Okay, finally, where did this thing come from? Where did this, this 250 meter thing come from? Well, this is where you need a third and even larger universe, which is called the inflationary universe. So we have a theory which is not very well tested, but there are some tests that have been done that have been shown to be true that, that this universe, that the Big Bang universe that started our universe was created out of a much larger universe, an inflationary universe. And what this inflationary universe is and how to picture it, I can't help you because we don't really understand what it is. It is a universe made up of a field of energy that we don't know what it is, but we've invented a field which if that field of energy exists will lead to the creation of a Big Bang universe. And the idea here is that, it is that there's this four dimensional universe out there filled with some sort of energy field and because of quantum mechanics in this energy field, the energy had their fluctuations and some bits of energy get created and then suddenly disappear. Another bit gets created and suddenly disappears. Inside this inflationary universe, sometimes a, a piece of energy gets, that's created by the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, but instead of it going back that way, it actually begins to change its, um, its, its state and it begins to expand very rapidly, faster than the speed of light. And as this thing expands, it cools down. And, but at some point it stops expanding because there's no more energy to drive the expansion. And at this point, all the, the, this inflation is very, very cold, but because it's been inflating and energy is being created during the inflation, the, this universe suddenly heats up. And that heating up of the universe produces a, a thing that looks like our Big Bang. So we have this third level of universe where energy fluctuations are, are coming into existence. Most of them are disappearing, but a few of them will begin to expand very quickly, cool down, and then suddenly get filled with particles up to this very high temperature, the temperature that we're, uh, which is the Big Bang. And then that Big Bang is what starts our universe. And we actually have evidence for the physics of this earlier universe, not much evidence, but there were predictions made that we should perceive particular things in the sky, and we actually have seen those. So this third universe, we don't know how big it is, and it's just a wild guess from theories that are very poorly constrained, but this universe is probably at least 10 to the 10 to the 30th power bigger than this second universe I was talking about. So this is, if you go online and you try to, and you, then you look on inflationary cosmology or chaotic cosmology, you'll see pictures of, uh, like this, of little universes being created. Some have expanded a lot, some are just being created. Um, the one thing is that they're not close to each other. They don't intersect with each other. If two universes intersected with each other, we'd see a gigantic circle of information in the sky that we don't see. So this is the third universe. And in this third universe, the inflationary universe, there are a multitude of other universes that if our universe was created like this, quantum mechanics says that other universes must be created also. So that's why we need three universes. The observable universe, beach ball size, a, a larger universe, which we're expanding into, and that's the Big Bang. And then the Big Bang was created by an energy fluctuation in an even larger universe, which is called the inflationary universe. And this inflationary universe could be infinite. We don't know, but we know it's at least 
roughly maybe it's a guess 10 to the 10 to the 30th larger than this the big bang universe so i want to leave you with this particular picture um, which is the cosmic microwave background so again this is a picture of the universe taken at 380,000 years after the big bang and you're seeing here tiny little fluctuations of temperature, hotter and colder. These fluctuations are fluctuations that are left over from this inflation that happened and from this the largest universe to the Big Bang universe. These are actually were originally little fluctuations of energy inside a probably something like a subatomic particle. But if you look at this picture, there's something really unusual about it. You know, there's a big blue spot over here. There's a big orange spot over here. But the, the unusual thing about this is that, is that when you look at it carefully, this picture is really made up mostly of spots of about the same size. Like it's not just, there aren't just random spots here. The spots all have roughly the same size. There are other spots that are larger and smaller, but there's one spot which is, which is by far in a way the most common. And that spot is about one degree across. And the interesting thing about this is that Okay, this is the universe when it was after the Big Bang, after 380,000 years after the Big Bang. Suppose that you were at the time of the Big Bang, you were able to survive, and want, you've watched your universe expand until it's 380,000 380, years old. Your observable universe would only be out, you can only see out to about 380,000 years. You couldn't see anything beyond that because the universe isn't old enough. Only over time do you see farther and farther in the universe. So when this picture is, this picture represents the universe when it was 380,000 years old, but each, you could, if you lived in this universe, you could only see out a small distance, about 380,000 light years away from us, from you. It turns out each one of these spots to within a factor of the square root of three, it turns out, is 380,000 light years across. So each one of these spots in this picture is actually a separate universe at the time this picture, this picture represents. That is, this spot over here, this blue spot over here, can't see the spot over here because this blue spot can only see out to the edge of the spot because its, it's universe isn't old enough that it can see the whole thing. So each one of these things in this picture, each one of these spots at the time of the universe when the, the light was created, each one of these spots is a separate universe. So if you want evidence that there are multiple universes, all you have to do is to look at this picture and say, I know for a fact that at 380,000 years after the Big Bang, there are thousands of multiple universes because each one of these spots is its own independent universe. Now, yeah, after time, the, the observable universe for those spots gets bigger and bigger, and all those spots begin to overlap with each other and they can begin to see each other. But at the time this was taken, this, these spots were all independent universes. So we have really strong evidence that there are other universes in analogy by looking backwards at time. And presumably we're, we're sitting inside a spot that's expanded out to 13.8 billion years, roughly in look back time. But there are other spots that are farther away that are also expanded out that far. And over time, some of these spots will overlap, but starting about 15 billion years from, from now, those spots will actually begin to be pulled apart due to dark energy. So I've explained to you three different universes, the observable universe, beach ball size, a what I call a meta-universe, which is the size of that liquid tank, liquid gas tank about 250 meters across, and then the inflationary universe. Someone asked me about multiverses. The multiverse that, I, that you will hear about, Brian Green talk about and other string theorists has nothing to do with what I've just talked about. That's in a completely separate theory, a completely separate mathematical theory. String theory, which is a wonderful field to, to study in, does not deal with our universe. It deals with a toy model universe. And the hope is that in the future, the string theory can be brought in to describe our universe. But right now, string theory is talking about a universe which has different laws of physics 
somewhat than our, the universe that we see today. Their universe is a very simple universe where black holes are much sim more simple to, to define. The universe, our universe, black holes are much more difficult to define. And um, I won't go into why that's the case, but it is. And so when you hear people talking about multiverses, that's all really wonderful, great mathematics. But if it's associated with string theory, there's nothing to do with, with what I'm talking about. This picture, which looks like multiverses, this is, it exists inside the inflationary universe. And yes, people will call these multiverses because they are multi, multiple universes, but this is not the same as a string theorist multiverse, which is what everyone hears about. So. Excuse me, we actually have two related questions. Mm -hmm. So Matt asked, can you expand on the evidence we have for the meta universe and the Ur universe, or are they primarily theoretical at the moment? Well, the meta universe is again looking at this picture. It's it's each one of the spots is can only see out three hundred eighty thousand light years from the center of the spot. They can't see farther away from that. So each one of the spots is independent of all the other ones. They don't know the existence of the other ones. But over time, as it as the universe ages, all those spots begin to overlap, and they can begin to see the other spots. So. So we know that at 380,000 years after the Big Bang, there are multi, multiple universes. We see them in the picture. Every one of these spots is a different universe. So by analogy, our universe, which is a certain age today, it would be really weird if all of a sudden, at, at exactly the age of our universe, we ex there's nothing beyond what beyond our observable universe. That is, all of a sudden, as our universe gets bigger and bigger, all of a sudden, there's no galaxies that we're expanding into. That is, the observable universe is exactly the same size as the thing that we're expanding into. That just seems really unreasonable because we know for the last 14 billion years, our universe has been expanding. And as it expanded, other spots, these other spots have come into the edge of the universe. These are galaxies. And the number of galaxies has increased. So it's, it's almost certain we're expanding into something that is significantly larger. And we can actually measure the minimum size of that by measuring the local curvature. So what was the other part of the question? Um, yeah, so this is actually another question um, from Katrina and it's related to the expansion of the universe. So the question is, if we need three universes to explain our universe, um, then what exactly is our universe expanding into? And will the expansion of our universe influence the other two universes? Well, the, our universe is, our universe is expanding and it's also getting older. So the distance between galaxies, the stretching is making the galaxies look more distant apart, but at the same time, the universe is getting older. As the universe gets older, it needs to, ex it needs to expand the edge of the universe such that galaxies will come in at the edge over time. Just like these, okay, another way of thinking of it, you have a still pond and you have a bunch of sand in your hand and you throw the sand into the pond. And when it hits the pond, all these little rings begin to, to appear, the little waves that go out from where the sand hit. When the sand first hits, each one of those rings is very, very tiny and they don't overlap. But over time, those rings get bigger and bigger and bigger and they all begin to overlap. So what we're seeing here is we're seeing essentially like the sand hitting the pond and we're seeing the individual um, uh, fluctuations. But over time, as the, the rings spread out, they begin to overlap and we see the universe as we see it today. So I can't prove to you that our universe is expanding into something bigger, but we've known for the past 14 billion years that galaxies have come in to the edge of our universe. And therefore it seems unreasonable then that tomorrow, all of a sudden there are gonna be no galaxies coming in at the edge. We are expanding into a bigger universe, just like throwing a, a pebble into a pond, that ring gets bigger and bigger and bigger and the pond is much bigger than the ring. Yeah, if the, it seems unreasonable that when you throw something into a, a, into a pond and the ring begins to expand, at a particular point, suddenly that ring will hit a perfectly circular um, edge to the pond, and then there'll be nothing beyond it. No, it really looks like we have to be expanding into something. So the second universe, we have very good evidence by analogy that we're expanding into it. And by measuring the curvature of our present universe, we know what the minimum size of this larger object is. 
The other question was what? Um, I think the second part of the question was, will the expansion of our universe influence the other two universes? No, we're the, the, so the universe we're expanding into is, is expanding also. And so the galaxy there, again, if we freeze our universe between the edge of our observable universe is 46 billion light years away, galaxies that are farther away than 66 billion light years away, we will never see. We will never see it. Their gravity will never get to us. They will never, ever influence us. So our, our sphere of influence or the sphere of causality only extends out right now in a frozen universe at proper distances to 66 billion light years. The thing we're expanding into is much, much bigger than those, 250 times bigger than that at the time of the Big Bang. So no, the expansion of our universe is being carried along with the expansion of this larger thing. Everything's expanding at the same time. It's just that at some point, the galaxies are so far away that the expansion appears faster than the speed of light. And so you never see them and they're not physically affecting you. Um, excuse me, Dr. Sunset. Yep. We have a question from both Tanae and Matt and it goes, is it possible for the gravitational pull between two universes to merge multiple universes together? Could a universe collapse in on itself due to its own gravity? And would this lead to a cycle of big bangs where the universe expands and then compresses over and over? If something, anything again, outside of 66 billion light years, if it's farther away from that in, in the universe today, its light is never gonna to get to us. If its light never gets to us, the speed of gravity is also the speed of light. Gravity is never going to get to us. So no, the, the, what we see today and a little bit farther out to 66 billion light years, that will affect the expansion of the universe. But everything outside of that has no effect whatsoever in the future because it's stretching away from us faster than the speed of light. And so you can't have a universe here and a universe over here and them feeling gravitation from each other because those two universes are, can't see each other. They can't feel each other. The speed of light is such that these two universes um, have, can't influence each other. And as a matter of fact, these two universes, because they're two little bubbles inside this larger 250 meter thing, those bubbles are moving away from each other faster than the speed of light because the thing we're inside this meta universe is expanding faster than the speed of light at its edges. So this whole thing is getting carried away. So our sphere of influence is essentially what you see here, plus a little bit. Um, Dr. Sansef, uh, Jeremy wanted to know, what do you think of the theory that our universe is inside of a black hole that's perhaps expanding? Um, inside a black hole. It is a, if you, there, there's an interesting coincidence which has never been explained fully is that I've now told you how big our universe is, how many galaxies there are, how much dark matter there is, how much dark energy there is. If you add up all of that stuff, all of that matter and energy, remember matter and energy are the same because equals MC squared, you can end up with the amount of mass energy in the universe. If you then say, okay, how big is, if I have that amount of mass, how big is that object? Turns out that the, you take all of the mass and energy of the universe and the size of a black hole with that amount of mass and energy turns out to be almost identical to the size of our present universe. That doesn't have to be the case, but it's too good a coincidence to ignore. So are we inside a black hole? doesn't seem necessary to think that we're inside a black hole. We probably aren't, we're not 100% sure, but we have to explain this coincidence that the amount of mass and energy we see, it creates, a, if we could create a black hole with that amount of mass and energy, that black hole would be about the same size as our present universe. And that coincidence, I hope one of you who goes into astronomy and astrophysics and cosmology will find the explanation to that coincidence because it's something that's bugged me for a long time. And as far as I know, no one has a good answer for why this coincidence exists. It doesn't say we're inside a black hole. We don't need to be inside of a black hole for any of these theories that I'm talking about. 
but it still is a weird coincidence. Excuse me, Dr. Sunset. Yep. Um, we have two related questions, one from Tanay and one from Chuan. Mm -hmm. So Tanay asks, how exactly do you define a universe when claiming there are at least three universes? And Chuan asks, is there a point in the universe or beyond where space-time does not exist? Well, I'm, I'm, I've given you these three universes because I need to be able to explain the size of our observed universe and it, knowing its age. So I know what, so I have to have that universe, the observable universe. But then I also know that our universe has to be expanding into something bigger for the reasons that I've given you. So it means I need a second universe. That second universe, I can't observe directly because the stuff that we're expanding into, I can't see it. So it, I'm, I'm creating a theory which is untestable, which is not exactly scientific, but we need to have that theory in order to explain what we see in the observable universe. But then this larger thing, you have to ask, well, where did it come from? And that other thing that, where did it come from, was purely a theory back in 1980 when Alan Guth created the inflationary universe. And he created the inflationary universe not to explain any of this, but to explain why there are no magnetic monopoles. The whole basis of this cosmology is, was, was originally created to get rid of magnetic charges. It's a crazy idea. But, and, but when he created this inflationary theory, it, it ended up explaining everything else that we see. So if you want to explain where the Big Bang came from, you have to insert it into a larger theory. And so Alan Guth created that theory, to get rid of black monopoles. But when he created that theory, that theory predicted other things. And it turns out those other things we've been, we've been able to show exist. So we've verified some of the predictions made to his inflationary theory. That doesn't strongly prove that this third largest universe has to exist. But even if it doesn't exist, you have to ask the question, where did the Big Bang come from? Remember, the Big Bang is this 250 meter or larger thing that we're expanding into. So we would like to know where, that's, where that came from. So that requires a third and even larger universe. And there could be a fourth one and a fifth one that we will we need in the future. But right now, all we need are three. And as is there an edge to space and time? Um, well, we can't, I can't tell you anything that's outside of our observable universe. I'm, I'm guessing what's out there by analogy and by some indirect measurements. Um, but space and time towards the edge of the universe, as we look at it, become, becomes very strange because as we look towards the edge of the universe, things that are farther and farther away, their clocks slow down. The things just happen more and more slowly. And by the time you get right near the edge of our universe, time almost stops. So at the edge of the observable universe in the theories that we have, basically time is, is not ticking anymore. It never quite doesn't tick. And as the universe gets expands, those points will appear to the time will get faster and faster, but time gets slower towards the edges. So in a sense, mathematically, space and time don't exist outside of our observable universe in terms of our ability to measure anything. But in terms of trying to, to come up with a theory to explain what we see, then we need to assume that time and space exist in a much larger structure into which we're expanding. We also have another question about the multiple universes. Mm -hmm. um, Jay asked, what divides these universes and keeps them from interacting? Um, what divides the universes and keeps them? Well, that's when you create a theory, um, if you don't have very much data to create a theory with, you can put lots of stuff into your theory that you can't test right now. So one of the things we know is that we haven't intersected, we, we haven't intersected with a, another universe. I think I had a, a picture of that happening um, somewhere back here. I guess not. Maybe it was another talk. Um, here it is. So if we, if the universe, these multiverses in this third universe, the inflationary universe, if they, if they're close enough, then at some point they may touch. And so imagine two soap bubbles and you bring the two soap bubbles together and they merge. So now you've got a double soap bubble where they merge the, the, what, what they, the intersection is a perfect circle. 
So if our universe and another universe touch each other, we should see some sort of circular structure in the early universe. So one of the things that astronomers do is when they get, end up with a map like this, they ask the question, is there any statistical evidence in this map in the cosmic microwave background radiation for perfect circles, which would indicate a previous universe, or it also could indicate a, a black hole that was in a previous universe. And almost everyone who's done the statistics says, no, there's no evidence for perfect circles in this, which would indicate another universe touching us, except one person, um, Sir Roger Penrose, who in his statistics, he seems to be able to find circles in this. And no one else can except Pen Roger and his, the people that work with him. Um, Roger has since won the Nobel Prize, so you can't just say, nah, just forget about Roger. Um, but everyone else that's tried what he has done has not seen any evidence for circles in this picture, perfect circle, which would indicate we are touching another universe. So therefore we can create, we have to create a theory so that universes can never touch each other on the average because we don't see it happening here. And so we can throw this in as a free parameter in the theory and we can create an inflationary space with an inflationary field such that as this universe evolves, this, this largest universe, the inflationary universe, as stuff gets, 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 as universes are created in it, this universe is expanding so fast that these separate universes are separating faster than the speed of light and we'll never see each other. So, you know, just imagine a rubber sheet that's being stretched in all directions and you plop something down on it like a, in, or you, you, you it's like a, a sheet of water and you, you throw sand in it, but the water itself is expanding. The rings, although are trying to expand, they expand slower than the actual stretching of the, the water beneath them. And so in effect, the rings will never overlap, overlap, with you, have, overlap with each other. So we get around that by adding something into the theory to stop it from, from in, universes intersecting. It's just a part of the theory to explain why we see no evidence for rings in these, in these maps. I think we have time for one, maybe two more questions. I'm game for as many as you want. <laughs> um, so uh, another question is from Aaron and he asks, besides the Higgs boson becoming unstable, what are some other possible deaths of the universe? Um, Other deaths of the universe. Well, there's there. Um, I think there's a book that just came out on this. Probably a couple of books on how the universe dies. The main main ones people talk about are the ones that I've already mentioned. Are the Big Rip, where dark energy overtakes everything and ends up pulling absolutely everything in the universe apart. Um, the other one is the instability of the Higgs or some other. Um, I mean, there could be other fields that we energy fields that we don't know about that are exist at even higher energies, and those also may be unstable. And it may be this is how universes spawn themselves. That is a universe, you know, our universe is pretty young. We still don't have all the galaxies that we're ever going to see in our universe. So as the universe expands and gets colder and the galaxies get farther apart, maybe there's enough time and there's the right energy that the these other energy fields be, become unstable. And when they become unstable, then they can go into an inflationary expansion and a new universe is created inside the universe that we already exist. You know, you can invent stuff like that. Um, but we're, we're extrapolating so far into the, into the future with data that we don't have that it's fun to speculate, like it's fun to speculate about extraterrestrial life, but we don't have any evidence yet. What we do know is that the Higgs boson is not unstable, but it's close. Um, so, how else could the universe die? Um, I'm sure there are lots of other, other ideas. I haven't really tried to understand them because I can't really test them with, you know, I, I'm an observer. I use telescopes to measure stuff. I can't point a telescope and figure out other ways of the universe dying. But I imagine there's some very creative ideas about other ways of the universe dying. I mean, one of them, this thing with the Higgs boson, there's a, a book written by Kurt Vonnegut and in the science fiction book, he creates something called ice nine, which is a form of water that turns into ice. But if you take this piece of ice nine that's now formed and put in other water, it turns that water into ice nine. So 
once you have one seat of ice nine, it just spreads out everywhere and everything gets turned into ice. So that's part of the thesis of the book. Well, Higgs boson is kind of like ice nine, that if one, if it gets unstable in one place, then that instability expands very quickly and it causes the, the, it disrupts the whole field ultimately across the universe and our universe ceases to exist as it is. So everything just ends up dying. So the ultimate fates of the universe is that, that everything dies, everything gets pulled apart, all life is meaningless, or the universe expands forever, cools down, gets colder and colder and colder, and ultimately you're only left over with black holes and over a gazillion number of years, those black holes evaporate according to Stephen Hawking, and you end up with this dead, cold universe of very, very low energy photons. And that's it for the rest of time. None of those sounds like a particularly fun universe to live in, but we're living in a universe and that's, that's what could happen. Um, we have one last question. Uh, Katrina asked, at what point does physics become philosophy if there are so many hypotheticals? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think a big debate is, is about theories that are created that are untestable. Um, if you create a theory that can't be tested with experiment, is that science? And there are a number of people that say, no, no, any theory that you come up with has to be testable for or uh, in science. And that's, there's a, a, Karl Popper wrote a philosophy book that science is, is a process of falsifying theory. So someone comes up with a theory, someone measures something that doesn't agree with the theory, you modify the theory. Things in science advance because a prediction is made and it's falsified by experiment. Well, what if a prediction is made and it's un, you can't test it? Is that science? And this particularly hot question in cosmology because people that don't like multiverses, don't like Brian Green, don't like all the attention given to a mathematical theory of, of a universe that doesn't even exist. It, it, the, the mathematical theory of string theory doesn't correspond to our universe. Um, one detail is that dark energy in the universe they play in is always negative, and yet we know that our dark energy is positive in our universe. Um, so they they all well, string theory is just total waste of time. You, you, you people aren't predicting anything that we can measure. Well, that's sort of true, except the most recent Nobel Prize did go to Roger Penrose, and what Roger Penrose showed was that mathematically is that is that is that a black hole uh, that a an object of any shape can collapse into a black hole. A black hole is perfectly spherical. It's it's defined by its mass, its um, and its spin, and the the black and electrical charge, but that's really negligible. So the ultimate, when something creates a black hole, it creates this perfectly spherical thing. But what what it started out with could be irregularly shaped. Well, it hadn't been mathematically proven that irregular shapes would collapse into black holes. And Roger Penrose mathematically showed that if you start out with a coordinate system in infinity, you could and you collapse this coordinate system, no matter what the original thing was, it would collapse into a black hole. That's the idea which won the Nobel Prize for Roger Penrose. The, the problem is that that's untestable. <laughs> and it's, it's going to be untestable for a long, long time. And yet he won the Nobel Prize for it. So all of these arguments from people saying, oh, it has to be testable. Karl Popper is right. Theories have to be falsified. Well, I'm sorry. The Nobel Prize just went to someone for a theory that is basically unfalsifiable. And so the the philosophy, I think, has changed without anyone noticing it, that we no longer require that all of our theories be testable somehow, that some theories allow, we, we allow some theories to be untestable, provided that they can be used to explain some things in the universe, even though we can't test the full theory. Um, so yeah, this that's philosophy. And the less amount of data you have, the more theory you can fit with that data, and the closer it becomes to philosophy and farther away from physics, in my opinion. All right, Dr. Sunsef, I am so sorry, but I think we're gonna have to stop. I think with the number of questions, we could probably go on for another hour. 
Yeah. So um, I would like everyone to please unmute and uh, thank Dr. Sunset for everything that he's 